Welcome to the Whitmer Cast, a podcast by the John Whitmer Historical Association. We bring you essays, interviews, panel discussions, and broadcasts related to Mormon history and restoration studies. My name is Jason Smith, and I'm a student at Chicago Theological Seminary, and I'll be your host for today's episode. And we have a great episode lined up for you today. We'll be talking with Stephen L. Shields, author of numerous books and articles, including his newest work, the fifth edition of Divergent Paths of the Restoration. If you'd like to join John Whitmer or visit our entire backlog of episodes and journals, go to jwha.info. With that out of the way, let's get started. Okay, Steve, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, I'm glad to, glad to share about the book and other topics of interest in church history. Thank you. Let's, let's start by uh, telling us a little bit about yourself. Well, I was... Uh, uh, born and raised in Utah, my ancestors on uh, both my father's and mother's sides of the family came from uh, Britain. My, my dad's side of the family, the, the surname side of the family came from Scotland. My mom's side of the family came from England. Uh, my, actually, I should say my dad's mother's family came from England too. So it's really just dad's dad's line of the family that were Scottish. Um, my, uh, on my mother's side, my great, great grandfather joined the original church in 1837. And on my father's side of the family, my great, great, great grandfather joined the original church in Scotland in 1841. And, uh, the, the American side of the family, uh, my great great grandfather was Albert Perry Rockwood, who's known in early uh, original church history. He was a member of the Vanguard Company of Pioneers with Brigham Young that entered the Salt Lake Valley on July 24th, 1847. Um, and uh, his folks had been in uh, the American colonies since shortly after the Mayflower. So there's that rich heritage and uh, early American uh, uh, European history in America. And then, you know, the foundational uh, period of what later became Utah. My, my Scottish ancestors weren't able to emigrate until 1850. Uh, and they took a, a uh, boat down the Clyde River from Renfrew, Scotland, ended up in Liverpool on a seafaring vessel that then docked in New Orleans. And then they took a paddle wheeler up to St. Louis and then a smaller paddle wheeler up the Missouri. And they landed <clears throat> at what is now Kansas City, and uh, they uh, equipped themselves with all of their necessary things at Westport, uh, which is a historic neighborhood of Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, and uh, they never went to winter quarters. The Scottish folks, they just diagonaled right across the corner of what's now Kansas and up into Nebraska to hit the trail. Um, my uh, American side of the family, the Rockwood family, they were at winter quarters. And then, of course, the Vanguard Company, you know, 140 odd people that trekked out across to the Great Salt Lake Valley and made a camp at Pioneer Park. And I'm, I'm proud of my, my family's heritage and uh, I connect with that. I, uh, I grew up typical Mormon boy in Utah and uh, found an interest in church history and took that fuller than what my parents were comfortable with because it caused me to question a lot of the official uh, dialogues of what the church's history was. And by the time I was a freshman at BYU, I pretty much had self-debunked the one true successor to Joseph Smith idea. And uh, the, the first edition of what became known as Divergent Paths of the Restoration was published at the end of my freshman year at BYU. And uh, I probably spent more time on that than I did studying, but I still got fairly decent grades that year. So it's not a total loss, I suppose. But that launched for me uh, what, you know, I was, I was 18 years old at the time. Uh, it's been a 50-year journey 
uh, through five editions of the book. Uh, each book edition a little more uh, comprehensive in its content. In some cases, uh, a little better writing, maybe. Uh, uh, never, uh, uh, up until the fifth edition, I never had more than just under 200 expressions that I had cataloged. And, and that's what Divergent Paths is. It's a catalog, really, of expressions of the movement, um, some of which are definitely denominationally structured organizations, some of which are ministries that have a little different uh, tack on a certain focus that you wouldn't find maybe in one of the mainstream churches, and a few samples of some internet expressions. Uh, but I realized early on that, that those internet expressions, when we had the old Yahoo groups thing, they were cropping up on a whim with all kinds of things going on and then disappearing just as quickly. And while it's all part of the story, it was that's harder to get a handle on when they don't have a physical location where you can actually meet a person in person. And, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I did the typical things that a good Mormon boy would have done in my era growing up, uh, baptized at eight, deacon at 12, teacher at 14, priest at 16. I was ordained an elder at 18, uh, which was a little unusual in my town because they usually didn't ordain the boys until they were ready to leave on their missions. I got ordained a year earlier than that. Um, went to BYU for the year, then headed to South Korea as a missionary. Uh, and I got South Korea in my blood and have never been able to get it out. So uh, two things kind of running parallel in my inner being is uh, South Korea and uh, I shouldn't just limit it to South Korea, but that's my experience has been in the southern part south of the DMZ uh, and printers ink because I started out in the printing business in high school and uh, you get me near a printing office and I smell what print, you know, printer's ink from the printing office and I kind of go, oh yeah, what a nice smell. Uh, so I was in book publishing and printing business for a long time before I ended up becoming a church man in, uh, in the early 1980s when I switched from LDS to Community of Christ. Well, that's a little bit about me. So, talked about when you started this at a young age, the first edition. What what motivated you to get started in this divergent path of the restoration studies? Um, in in the LDS uh, system, they I assume they still have early morning seminary. Uh, I have not kept up with all of that, but when I was a kid in high school, we had early morning seminary. But because I was in Utah, the, uh, the church actually had a seminary classroom building across the street from the high school, and they offered daytime classes. It was possible for public high school students to take a, one class off a day and go to the Mormon seminary and get uh, religion classes over there. Uh, prior to my becoming high school, there was a time when those classes were given high school credit. Uh, by the time I got to seminary in the early 70s, that was no longer being done in Utah. But uh, there were four years of, of seminary, uh, New Testament, Old Testament, Book of Mormon, and church history, which included Doctrine and Covenants. And I just happened to have the church history class in my senior year. I was aware of the what was then called the RLDS Church, the now Community of Christ, because in Utah, they would have a booth at the state fair and uh, uh, basically have Bible bashes with Mormon visitors who passed by their booth. Um, I went one year when I was an early high school teenager and uh, met some of the most uh, obnoxious people I think I've ever met. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, took the free tracks and took them home and kind of sat in a 
covered for a while. And then in my senior year in seminary, we had the early morning, I took early morning. I didn't take release time. I didn't want to miss out on my academic uh, education. So I went to school an hour early and did early morning seminary. We had to work harder. And uh, the teachers required term papers. So there were four a year. By the time I'm a senior, I've done 12 of these <laughs> term papers. And I, it's a church history class. So the term papers ought to be about church history. And I'm thinking about what to write about. And I discovered this package of RLDS tracts that I'd kept. And so I thought, oh, I'm going to write a term paper on how foolish the RLDS church is. And uh, it was received with great adulation from the seminary teachers about how well I'd done. One of the kids in my class said, well, I've, I've been out to Independence, Missouri, and there's another church out there that claims to have been started by Joseph Smith, Church of Christ Temple Lot, as we know it. So that was the next term paper right there, and it just sort of snowballed to where it became almost a life-consuming <laughs> pursuit of uh, who all was out there, uh, what they were all about, where they were, how they operated, when they existed, and what the extent was, and a lot of details have been lost to history, and some of those that are no longer extant. Um, some of the groups, um, particularly in Utah, a lot of the uh, fundamentalist groups are really, in, in all the years I was working, they've get, gotten a little more publicly open now, but they were cagey. They really didn't want to tell people much about what they were all about and who they were and what they were doing. And that, that was a tough one to get a handle on. But, but since, since my initial efforts there, lots of other folks have done a lot more detailed research. Uh, uh, my friend Brian Hales in his uh, multiple works on Mormon fundamentalism has been able to sort out a lot of the facts and people and timelines that uh, had been sort of elusive to most researchers. Uh, and, and, you know, I realized early on that the best I could do would be to provide an encyclopedia, a reference book with short snippets, that there was so much more material there that almost every one of those expressions that it's in, in that are listed in in uh, uh, fifth edition uh, there, there's books that can be written about each of those and since I started pushing divergent paths we've seen more and more researchers go after some of those uh, lesser known groups and, I, and I'm, I'm just thrilled to see you know Daniel Stone's book on William Bickerton and uh, uh, and as I mentioned, Brian Hales' uh, work on uh, the, the Mormon fundamentalists, the Apostolic United Brethren, uh, Ruin Jeffs and that, all of that. He's done a, ma a massive work trying to sort out the personalities and the connections and how those are all put together. Um, and, uh, and there's others, and I can't, uh, I can't list all of them, but it's really encouraging to see more and more more focused studies that are analyzing things where I, I don't do much analysis. I'm just trying to report the facts as I can best understand them. They, you know, here's the basic history. Here's some of the basic doctrinal framework. Here's some of the personalities uh, and leave it up to others to say, okay, I'm going to take this one and I'm going to dig deep and I'm going to, you know, analyze this and do some comparative religious studies with that. And, uh, so I, I hope basically what I've done with the fifth edition finally is uh, got it organized in a way that makes sense. I've got essential details in there that make sense, hopefully, that somebody else can say, you know, I want to focus on this section or this group or this, this expression, and I want to pursue that into a master's degree thesis or a doctoral dissertation or whatever it may be. And, uh, you know, that'll be... That'll be really great to see things like that happening. So in all these years, 50 years, you've, you've been doing this research. Have there been any surprising revelations or what kinds of things have you learned about the restoration movement in general? Well, um, wow. I, I suppose one of the first things that 
that sort of surprised me, but then on further reflection, it shouldn't have, was when I was a young 20-year-old missionary here in Korea, came across a disaffected Mormon member who had started his own church and he was complete with his own book of scripture and book of revelations and visitations from Jesus. And, and all of his documents were in the Korean language. And he was uh, not very successful in attracting a lot of followers, but he was just down the street from the LDS church where I was assigned. And uh, he was quite a personable fellow. Uh, and so I realized then that, and, and this was in 1976, so this is early on, that if there's one guy in Korea, there's got to be other guys, you know, outside of the English-speaking world doing other things. And you know, one thing led to another, and I found a, a handful of those. Um, and it could be there's not much more going on than that because there's simply many options that people could go to otherwise. I don't know, uh, but that's, a, that's an area that needs to be delved in maybe, but I don't know how to go about doing that. Uh, you almost need to have boots on the ground in places and get the tenor of what's going on. There's, there's been a bunch of that happening in Africa uh, when, uh, when LDS, uh, related churches started cropping up in Africa uh, kind of independently and then LDS folks were sent to go look there and help them and then when they discovered that, that because they were black they weren't going to be ordained they started their own groups that are off to the side but still using Latter-day Saint terminology and books and um, so there's got to be more than what I've cataloged. Uh, and those, those other ones will be in perhaps other countries where English is not the, the uh, lingua franca. And, uh, you know, I can do the Korean side of things, but I don't have other languages to where I could really ferret out details in those others. So that, that was surprising. Another thing that surprised me was that uh, uh, early on, when I was working on the first edition, uh, people were trying to steal what I'd come up with and do their own thing with it. And that kind of, uh, when I was at BYU, that sort of thing was sort of a counter to the standards of academics that everybody agreed to. And uh, you had to be really careful about keeping tabs on your own stuff. That, that was a disappointment more than a surprise. Revelations, other, you know, a, a lot of it, you know, my motivation in the beginning as a good Mormon boy was, is not the motivation that it morphed into. Um, and uh, I, I came to have very high respect, high regard for the, 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 a couple of hundred church leaders, apostles, and uh, in some cases, prophets and presidents of their own denominational structure. I have nothing but the highest regard for the integrity of those men and women. And uh, that, that was kind of surprising given the way I was brought up that, you know, nobody but us can even be nice people. Uh, and that was never spoken out loud, but there was this, this overt, you know, we're the only true church, everybody else is wrong. And if you're wrong, you're of the devil. And if you're of the devil, you're not a good person. And, um, and I, I found prophets and apostles who were just as sincere as the one that I recognized as a prophet or apostle and uh, was found myself just as comfortable sitting in Fred Larson's office at his church headquarters having discussions about the uh, remnant church. Uh, and and I, I miss Fred. Fred was a, became a wonderful friend. And we had wonderful chats and wonderful discussions. And, you know, he was curious about how Community of Christ, which had been his former, you know, upbringing church, how we had dealt with some of the issues they were faced with. He didn't know the church history as well as I did in some cases. And sometimes would ask me to lunch and want to pick my brain about, you know, how Community of Christ was trying to deal with all the, the uh, stuff that was going on in the church in India. And 
you know, if it, uh, I, I didn't, you know, there were no, you know, top secret classified pieces of information that, that were on the table. It was just, you know, he was so focused on building Zion and some of his apostles wanted to pursue overseas missions and, you know, it cost money to do that. And but we were, we had some good chats and, and his wife, Mary was such a sweetheart. And, and I'd known Dave Bowerman, who was one of the promoters of the Remnant Church back when Dave worked at church headquarters in Community of Christ. So I'd known Dave for a long time. And, and we maintained a good friendship. There, there wasn't even a rivalry that was ever part of the discussions. That, that was, you know, that, that I could find friendship in the Paul Savages of the Elijah Message Group and the Fred Larson's of the Remnant Church and and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, it was always it always was a beautiful thing to me the diversity that we had, but we still had come from that same extended family. Was uh, it's almost miraculous in some ways. Uh, that that was that was a lot of my motivation. I became really close with dear friends down on South Cottage Street in Independence at, at Alpheus Cutler's church uh, and, and was just moved to, I'm not sure how to express it, just it's such an emotional experience when they asked me if I would do Dan Whiting's funeral because they were all cousins and none of them felt they had the emotional stamina to take care of the funeral. And it was, it was such a privilege I was so honored by that request that, and this has been 10 or more years ago now that he passed, Stan had become a good friend. His wife had become a good friend. And, you know, to be called upon as a minister, to come in and be a pastor to a family that is suffering the death of not only a, a loved cousin and brother, but their church leader too, and that, and that church is kind of unique in that it's a very tight knit little family and they're all cousins. And I, I was able to do ministry, you know, give comfort to Stan and his wife in the last few weeks of his life at their home and then at the hospice in Kansas City. And to let Stan know that he didn't need to worry about Shirley that you know she was in good hands with the loving community that they had but you know I, I i even went with shirley to the funeral home to pick out caskets and make those kinds of arrangements i'm not even a family member but she asked me to come and help and i was very honored to be asked so th those kinds of experiences tell me that it, it the book tongue-in-cheek title just simply will not ever be fruits and nuts of the restoration some people have called it that in kind of a sarcastic joking and and there are people that are in the book who who are way out in left field in some cases and, but they need to be included because they're part of the story. The Lafferty's have to be included because they're part of the story. They, they, that, that whole situation with them was just as, as gruesome and evil as any story can possibly get. I don't consider them friends. I, I can't quite find it in myself to be friends with people that are that violent. It's hard. But they're part of the story. You know, Irville LeBaron and his folks, again, just nothing but violence. It's hard to be a part of that circle and story. And, and uh, I, I was privileged to be friends with some of Joel's, uh, Joel LeBaron's family and Verlin LeBaron's, uh, one of his wives became quite good friends with me years ago. And uh, the violence that has erupted and disrupted that community has always been kind of heartbreaking because I know good people that are there. And, you know, so you, you have the spectrum of all of humanity in this microcosmic expression of one particular religious movement that is on the world scope of things rather small. Uh, you know, at, at our, our biggest claim to fame, uh, you know, is somewhere around 16 million people. And most of those are 
50 East North Temple Salt Lake City people. But even at that size, it's a tiny denomination on the world stage of religion. And even the, the Southern Baptists in the United States have 10 times that many people just in the U.S. So, you know, it's the, the whole of the Smith Rigdon movement is rather small, but very rich in its diversity and very rich in its, uh, the, the expression that uh, God was still talking to humans. That was kind of the bottom line for Joseph Smith Jr. Even though he became restrictive about who could speak as God for the whole church, he opened up a whole culture of people being able to claim that they prayed about it and had a vision from God, a visitation from Jesus or an angel. And uh, those stories in my book are plentiful. Uh, so there's there's a lot of a lot of stuff there, Jason. That just it's not easy to put into a simple paragraph. Well, thank you for that. And by the way, I miss Fred a lot too. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Mary. In these in these fifty years of research, what what are some of the obstacles that you faced? And maybe some give a couple of examples of hard cases as far as getting information. Oh well, uh, hard cases start. Uh, you know. Number one hard case is uh, Colorado City. Uh, ru uh, not Ruin. Ruin was the dad. Warren. Warren Jeffs. That, that group of folks, is, uh, they've been tough nuts to crack. Really hard to get information out of them. Now, some, some people have become more successful by finding other avenues in. And uh, Lindsay um, Hanson Park at Sunstone Magazine has done an awful lot of incredible stuff there with that, with not just the Jeffs, but the broader community that's down in, in uh, that part of the, the world. You know, er, er, early on, everything was done through the post. We didn't have email and uh, we didn't have the internet. So it was a lot easier in many respects to write a letter and get a, a full response to print a booklet and get tracks and books. Whereas now everybody's got Facebook pages and whatever, and you don't get any of the depth that a book can give you don't get uh, you know for for well with with almost any of them i uh, i have stacks of letters over a decade of time from uh, joseph calabrese who was one of the church representatives of the church of jesus christ uh, monongahela and uh, he was one of the 70 evangelists and uh, just copious letters all handwritten back and forth you know, I'd ask a couple of questions and he would answer them fully. Did the same thing with Paul Savage's dad, uh, James Savage, at the uh, Elijah Message uh, Church. Uh, James Savage was, was probably the, the number one follower of W.A. Draves. And, and I got some letters from Draves too, but Savage was the correspondent, the secretary in the office at the church and handwritten letters, you know, just volumes and volumes of handwritten letters back and forth. Uh, now with, with emails, it's like, well, how do you put an email in a file for later research? Well, you print it out, I suppose, or you find ways to do it all electronically, but it has lost a lot of the personal touch. So uh, I, I think the internet in a lot of respects is a stumbling block to the quality of research that can be done when you're actually making a trip to independence and sitting down in somebody's living room or around the kitchen table talking about John the Baptist coming down the stairs, you know, in 1937 and hearing it, you know, right firsthand. Then you get some, uh, and, and it's a stumbling block issue where people get so angry at the others that they become anti the other and so you really don't get good quality information you just get anti-diatribe from them that's not helpful in trying to sort out an understanding uh you know of, of what people are trying to do in in my book as it stands now i i completely rewrote everything that i'd had in previous editions so uh, while there's going to be sections that will be duplicated from previous editions that seem to be okay I'm sure that I don't have all the facts right. I'm sure that I've misconstrued something, not on purpose, but just in trying to explain or listening to an explanation from somebody, it's, it's easy to not quite see it or understand it the same way as they were hoping you would because there's some 
nuance or some background, but I've tried hard to overcome those kinds of stumbling blocks. I've tried hard to be as objective as possible, but I don't think it's possible to be fully objective, uh, no matter what. But I've tried, and uh, you know, I, I, that's a, a commitment from the get-go. That, that uh, and 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 those who were willing, I send drafts of what I'd written and let them look at it. You know, church leaders and say, here, not all of them were willing to do it, but many were, and they they write back and say, well, you know, I think in this part maybe better expressed if you were to say this, it kind of fits better with the way we say things. I got some really helpful information from people. But, but again, that's not everything in the book because some were just simply not available to do that uh, for whatever their reasons might have been. But I tried to do it. So it, uh, the biggest stumbling block was yours truly. In, my, in uh, 2006, my, my interviewer came to my house and he said, I'm staying for a couple of weeks. We're going to get all your files sorted so that you can get the fifth edition written. And it took me from 2006 to uh, 2021 <laughs> before it was ever finished. But, uh, you know, Jason came up from Oklahoma and camped out. And we, I had, I think I ended up with 18 bankers boxes full of files. We finally got it all sorted and organized. And it took me years to get through all of that. And then, of course, as I'm going on, then other things happen, new things crop up, new information on old things crop up. And uh, it's just a never ending, you know, the world is in flux like that. So the book is never going to be exactly up to date because by the time you get it off the press, it's already been a year since you finalized the manuscript and lots can happen in a year. But yeah, I, I owe Jason a big debt of gratitude to kind of get me off of dead center. And even though it took more years than I ever imagined, we did finally get it done, Jason. Yeah. Well, Steve, if, um, if you could go back in time to when you were first beginning this, this journey and give yourself some advice, things to avoid or things to do differently, what, what would you say to yourself? I would probably say stop. Find something else in church history <laughs> that you can do. <laughs> no, no church history project should take 50 years. <laughs> uh, but, but it became my baby, and I tried to raise it the best I could. It has been, at times, very fulfilling and enriching, at times, maddening and frustrating. I tend to fall on the side of perfectionism, so it means that First draft is never good enough for me. You know, what you're seeing in the, the final version of, of the book, which is available in ebook form from Amazon and Barnes and Noble both, is probably the 10th or the 11th or maybe the 12th draft of the content. Figuring out a way to organize it was just excruciating. There, there was nothing that seemed to just rise to the top and say, yeah, here's the magic answer to all of this, because not everything fits into a simple slot. Would I do it again? I probably would. I, I, I've enjoyed it. It's been this driving passion. And, and if you look back uh, in, in uh, the, the Mormon history, I've not had much in Mormon history journals, but in, in John Whitmer journals where I've had most of my papers, but it's always on a topic related to the book. There's very rarely that I've divert, di deviated from that, but that was what I was doing. That was what was consuming my interest and attention. I amassed hundreds of file folders of information. It's, it's now all been cataloged in the Community of Christ archives. I've got, uh, there's actually three parts to the collection now. And I've probably got, except for church officials, I probably have the largest linear foot collection of documents in the Community of Christ archives of anybody else. Uh, you know, again, not, not, you know, first presidency files, bishoprics files, those kinds of files are going to be much, much more extensive. But as a single individual who was never in those leading ranks of the church, um, I, I think the Shields Factions collection is one of the largest that they've got there. So uh, it's got, uh, I must have close to 40 archive boxes, maybe a few more than that, uh, which is, is huge. It's a ton of stuff. And it's very helpful for researchers too. 
Well, yeah, and, and researchers can go dig through all that. I've got a, a bunch of the files, and then it's not the whole collection. I've got a bunch of the stuff on a DVD ROM. Over the years, it was more practical sometimes to keep e copies of stuff than printed copies of stuff. And so, but you've got to have both the, because it's not a comprehensive uh, scan of every, it's not a digitization of every single sheet of paper in the collection. So, and then, and then all the church periodicals are kept in a different section of the, they're in the closed stacks of the library. So they're not the periodicals that I amassed over all those years from all these different organizations are all cataloged by title in the periodical room next door to the archive room. So I suppose if we counted all that, there'd be even more linear feed of stuff of things that I've collected. So, but uh, it was good to be able to firsthand know many of the, of the actual firsthand prophets and seers and revelators of many of the groups that were newer. But most of them are gone now. So, you know, W.A. Draves, I knew well. He's been gone for 20 years. His son, Leonard, uh, I knew well. And Leonard has been gone for a few years now. But, uh, but I was able to know many of those early, you know, second, third generation church leaders that are gone now. So there's some, there's some stuff that can't be redone. But there's new people to interview and talk to and Organizations are always dynamic. They're changing, responding to the science, societal pressures around them. You know, stuff that you're needing to be updated once in a while too, uh, as especially the larger denominations kind of relook at who they are and what they're about and refocus energies and find new priorities of mission and how they go about doing it. Uh, so uh, the, the signature books asked me, well, it was, it was, uh, Gary uh, Bergera, before he retired, he said, so who's the younger generation, Steve, that, that we can go to for the sixth edition? Because you're obviously not going to do it. <laughs> so so we, we, you know, the, the signature's attitude is that, you know, every, every 10 years, this book probably should be updated with a new edition. And, but with the new management, we'll see. That was Gary. Gary was interested in the topic. Is the new management that much interest? Gary and, and, and uh, George Smith both. So uh, we'll see what happens. I, I, I'm ready to, uh, at this point in time, I just want to let the, the thing rest for a while. I'm not, I'm not actually accumulating files for a new updated edition. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> well, let's talk about the new edition for a moment. Yeah. Um, to those that are familiar with the previous editions, which is a lot of a lot of folks that have really come to love those those editions. Yeah. What's what's new and different about the fifth edition? Well, uh, first Besides of all, more groups. Uh, anything that was in the previous editions has been rewritten uh, and updated, uh, and hopefully more reflective of that particular entry's current status. I uh, probably the the biggest change in appearance is the decimal numbering system that I came up with to organize the groups into sections, the expressions, and then to do a chain of how they come down the line, sort of like a pedigree chart. So you section one is is the original church, and that's the church up until Joseph Smith died. Section two is the original church 2.0. Basically, the few months between Joseph Smith's death and the uh, uh, council meetings in Nauvoo that uh, Brigham Young led that basically kicked out of position anybody who disagreed with Brigham Young. And, uh, and then we move into uh, section three being the Strangites, and they're done chronologically, who emerged first. And Brigham Young's church does not continue uninterrupted from original church 2.0. And I've had some mixed responses from LDS folks on that who feel like I've misconstrued church history as they would like it to be presented, uh, but I stand by my numbering system. So if the first group is 1.0, then the first group who left and went off in a separate direction is 1.1. And in some cases, there's a 1.1.1 uh, as people kind of moved on from things. 
uh, doesn't happen too often. Uh, in section four, which is about Brigham Young's followers, we get down to about 4.17 when, when the uh, Apostolic United Brethren started up, and then you've got a lot of things beneath that as that certain people in those, that group went different directions. And, uh, it, it's, uh, it looks complicated on one hand, but when you understand that these are all derivatives from the other, it, it seemed to make sense to me and some other people who looked at it. So that's, that's the biggest difference is trying to do that in a sensible chronology that keeps similar groups together in sort of family groupings rather than strict chronology, which would just go with the dates or with an alphabetic entry like an encyclopedia would do. But then you have 130 entries that are all Church of Christ. And you wouldn't know who's connected to whom until you tried to go through all the notes and figured out where they belonged. So, of course, the, the, uh, the uh, again, the number, as you mentioned, the, the number of entries is much bigger. That means the content is going to be more comprehensive. I also included, though, some appendices that have documents in them that are relevant to more than just one, one expression. Uh, and so there's some extensive appendices that deal with elements of, for example, the articles of faith and practice that were adopted by the Church of Christ on the Temple lot, but then have been used almost intact by all the other groups that kind of come from that heritage. There was no, it seemed to me there was no reason to repeat it in every one of those entries, so I moved it to an appendix. The section that's at the very front of the book called Before You Begin is critical to understanding the premise of the book and who's included and why they're included. And to make clear that I'm not suggesting that each of these is a group per se, but that there are expressions of ministry that are related to the movement overall. I had a kind of a testy conversation with a, a woman who was promoting a um, kind of a Hebrew version of Mormonism. And uh, she said, we shouldn't be listed. We're not a group. And I said, well, I understand you're not a group, but you're not being listed because we don't just list groups. We list all these other expressions. Uh, she was not satisfied with that, but uh, I couldn't do anything to make her happy. But you know, there's the, the sociological dynamic of, you know, cult, sect, denomination, whatever. I, I said, that's not helpful in this discussion. You know, you have uh, several organizations that have full organizations that could easily be called denominations, but yet they still exhibit sect-like qualities sometimes. So I've tried to distinguish some of that. So that'll be different in the book. There's a handful of photos, but it wasn't primarily... Uh, we weren't trying to take up space with lots of photos. We, the 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 ebook itself is 1,024 pages long. Now, if we stuck with an ebook, it could be 2,000 pages long. It wouldn't make a lot of difference. We could stick in a lot of photos. But if a print edition had been done at 1,000 pages of print, that was two volumes. And uh, that's pretty challenging when it comes to printing and uh, keeping prices at uh, something where people can, other than expense, libraries with expense, with huge endowments can buy them. What else is different in the book? Oh, rather than an, a strict index, I have several finding keys. And so uh, we've listed alphabetically all the churches, but with the code number that refers to the main entry. We've listed key personalities that are mentioned in the book. Again, with the code numbers as to where they show up, We're not using page numbers as the index. We're using the the serial numbers of the expression. Location, U.S., other countries. What other finding keys do I have in there? Oh, those are the major ones. Yeah, one so, by, by scriptures. Oh, by scriptures. Yeah, that's right. There's the scriptures. Yeah. So, uh, so there's a lot of different approaches at finding the information you're looking for. I've had several people who've read the book say that it just in the way it's laid out, it's just something that's very readable. And they've sat down and I, I've got a friend, he says, well, I, I finished section five tonight and I'll tackle, you know, I, but I'm going to, I didn't, I skipped over section four because it's so long. I'll go back and tackle that next. So he's just reading through it, you know, and, and following the story. And, and so it can be done that way because of the way I've organized it. 
you know, you've got expression X does this, and then they've got people that broke off from them and that broke off from them and then broke off from that. And, uh, you know, so you can kind of follow a story of a, a, a microcosm within the whole. So, you know, it's, I hope it's interesting reading. I, my, my writing style is probably not, I'm not, uh, not going to become Stephen King in uh, bestsellers, but uh, hopefully it's a readable, not too dull presentation of what we're trying to do. And I wanted to ask you about the, um, the subtitle. Oh, the subtitle. And the Smith Rigdon movement. Yeah. Can you briefly describe what you mean by that. Yeah. Um, as I've worked in this area for decades, most of my adult life now, all of my adult life, if I became an adult at 18, it's been all of my adult life. Well, that's a revelation right there. Wow. Putting that into numbers. I, I learned early on that the Alexander Campbell Barton Stone Restoration Movement and the word restoration movement itself meant a lot more than just how Joseph Smith's followers had co-opted it. Yes, it was a restoration movement of sorts, but as I kept digging and kept digging into that, I, I came to the realization that that whole idea of restoration never came along until Sidney Rigdon came along. Up until Sidney Rigdon, it was not a restoration movement. It was a movement of a great and marvelous work is about to come forth, which Joseph Smith was referring to the Book of Mormon. When Sidney Rigdon got involved, we suddenly start picking up language that was typ typical of Alexander Campbell and Barton Stone's language, Walter Scott's language, uh, who was another one of the great restorationists of the era. They were all contemporaries. We start hearing language of the ancient of days. It just struck me. And then as I dug further and further, became to, came to the realization that it was, had it not been for Sidney Rigdon, what we know as Mormonism today probably would have died out 150 years ago. Joseph Smith was not able to articulate a sound theological framework. And the lectures on faith, which for almost 100 years were published with the Doctrine and Covenants, that was the doctrine part of the book, as we come to find out, they were really primarily written by Sidney Rigdon, not Joseph Smith. And then as we look further into all of that, Sidney Rigdon is appointed in Revelation as Joseph Smith's mouthpiece. That's a pretty powerful position in the hierarchy of the organization. The uh, inspired version of the Bible. Alexander Campbell had published his own revisions of the Bible in 1825. That was not new knowledge. That There was no surprise that the King James Version wasn't really the best translation to be used in 1820s America, you know, the book was over 200 years old and used archaic language. Sidney Rigdon brought all of that with him when he hooked up with Joseph Smith. And Joseph Smith's little group of farmers, some of them well-heeled, with, with no question, uh, the Whitmers and Martin Harris had money. The uh, people following Cam uh, Rigdon in Ohio, and they'd been he had separated from Campbell in August of 1830, basically brought four to 500 people into a movement that had around 100. And pretty soon it was Sidney Rigdon's people that had the majority. The four writers of that early generation, Sidney Rigdon, Orson Pratt, Parley Pratt, and Joseph Smith, three of them were Rigdon people who had all been raised in the Campbellite tradition. Of restoration. If you look at the first apostles that were called, and half of them were Rigdon's people, who'd all been raised in the principles of Alexander and Thomas Campbell's ideals. Sidney Rigdon was a close colleague and friend of Alexander Campbell. They traveled together, they preached together, wrote articles in the, the church paper together for 10 years before Rigdon gets hooked up with Joseph Smith. And 
when you start looking at the literature that was being spread around by Walter Scott, their missionary, and all of this and that and the other, the millennial harbinger might as well have been the messenger and advocate because you see very common themes, very similar. Well, because it was Rigdon that was writing the bulk, Rigdon and Pratt and, and the Pratt brothers who were, the Pratt brothers were students of Rigdon's. He had trained them to become ministers. I don't think we who follow not Campbell, but but the Joseph Smith tra trajectory should be afraid of that. And so instead of using a, a language that pockets us in one particular rubric of interpretation, which is our own internal rubric, well, we're the restoration. I have been arguing for the last few years that we really, as the Campbellite, you know, disciples of Christ, Christian churches, uh, churches of Christ, came up with a an academic label. But you go to church and they don't say, oh yeah, we're the Stone Campbell movement. Only church historians use that to talk about church history. It'll bleed over into some astute people who've been reading the church history journals. But uh, we needed, I feel that we need an academic label. And I argue that that should be the Smith Rigdon movement. Smith Rigdon Restoration Movement. Uh, and that lets us have the restoration part of it, but it also gives us an academic uh, category that clearly says we're not Campbell Stone people. But when you look at the basis of what the two churches, two movements were doing, there's a lot of similar things that were going on in the early years. There was a lot of borrowing on our part, I think. I don't think Stone Campbell borrowed anything from us. They'd already done it all. But uh, I, I think calling us the Smith Rigdon Restoration Movement gives us an academic title that is sort of one step away from being uh, doing nothing but apologetics. And I think the Mormon history community and the books that are being published, we need to move more away from apologetics than we've been doing. There's been a lot of movement in, in my lifetime, but we need more critical thinking and not just apologetics. And this is one way to maybe get at that. Okay, thank you. We have a couple more questions before we close. And I wanted to, to ask you, um, in your years of research and with the new book, what would be a, a kind of a primary takeaway that you hope what people would, would take away from, from reading the new book or um, other books that you've written? I hope... With, with divergent paths, there will be younger generations who will say, hey, this is an area of research that I might have interested in. I want to focus on this group, this expression, or maybe want to talk about how these internet expressions have done something. So I think there's a, a dozens and dozens of possibilities for master's theses and perhaps even dissertations for doctoral level. So I hope there's that takeaway. Uh, but realize most people who will look at the book will be doing so out of curiosity, uh, have an interest in church history, and maybe they know a couple of the other groups. Oh, yeah, I live down the street from this outfit. That the, they'll have a, a greater appreciation for, for how wonderfully colorful the movement is. It's not a staid, dull movement. We got prophets and seers and revelators all over the place that are having interesting takes on what the gospel's all about. And some of them are able to come up with some really dynamic prose to express that. And, you know, you don't have to believe everything you read as far as, oh, I'm going to follow that guy or oh, I like this guy. It's like, that's an interesting way that guy's expressed this or that lady's expressed this because there's male and female both. And uh, that is, you know, wow, what a, what a rich history of the movement we have that's just so much more than the trek across the plains to Utah uh, or staying in Plano, Illinois, and then moving to Lamona, Iowa. And, uh, you know, it's just so much bigger and so much more diverse. And there's so many more colorful people. The story of James Brewster is just fascinating. Ten-year-old kid at Kirtland. And he begins receiving visitations from Moroni and uh, between over the, you know, he was reprimanded because, oh, little kids aren't supposed to do that. But it emerged, they ended up in Springfield, Illinois, contemporaneously with Nauvoo. 
And a, a full-blown church emerged with this uh, whole panoply of scriptural writings that Brewster had, had translated. And then they, after Joseph's death, they have this community that they try to move to the West. They focus in Kirtland as their headquarters. They publish a newspaper there. Brewster takes a company of 100 people or so West, and they try to figure out how to set up a colony somewhere. It all falls apart on the trip somehow over the next 10 years. But you know, his scriptural uh, books are really quite interesting to look at. Not badly written either. They're pretty competent. You know, is were they really from an angel or were they just his imagination? Well, that's not for me to decide. I That's not where my faith preferences lie. So no, I'm not a believer in James Brewster and his scriptural books, but that doesn't mean somebody else can't be. Uh, and it doesn't mean you can't look at them simply from, from an academic viewpoint and say, oh, the, the, these, these look and feel like what you would expect in scripture if you look at the Bible. There's people like that. Then there's people like Chris Namalka, who in recent years has gained lots of fame and infamous, infamacy <laughs> uh, over his stuff. But his, his two massive volumes on the Book of Lehi and the sealed plates of the Book of Mormon, you know, nobody can just sit down and write that stuff unless they've got some tools in their head to do it with. And just the the literary production itself is massive. You know, there's other parts of the story that just, you know, don't, don't match up really well, but he got quite a few people following him and giving him money and grave sites in the family plot in the Salt Lake City Cemetery, much to the chagrin of other relatives, but, uh, uh, you know, so there's all kinds of stories like that. You know, the, this TV series, apparently, that's gaining quite tra a lot of traction under the banner of heaven uh, in the States. Yeah, maybe there's another movie series in this book. Who knows? <laughs> so, Steve, if, uh, if somebody becomes inspired by uh, your book and your work, um, what advice would you give them if they want to do similar research? Well, um, just you, you got to be prepared for the long haul, I think. Um, it's, it's, it's once you start uncovering details, they don't stop getting uncovered. And um, at, at, at some point in time in my work, I just had to say, no, I've got to cut things off at this point. Because if I don't, I'll never finalize the manuscript because more stuff keeps coming all the time. So it, it, it kind of becomes a never-ending project. And, and if you don't find some strict uh, boundaries for what you're trying to do without a good focus, you'll never get anything done at all. And uh, this fifth edition was, was very much in danger of never getting done because of that. And, and you know, it just... I, I didn't, because I was working full-time and traveling a lot for my job, I didn't have a lot of time to just sit down and focus. You know, it shouldn't have taken from 2006 to 2020 or 21 to finally get it finalized. But it did because of that very problem. I'd, I'd work through boxes of stuff and then I'd have to go back and repeat some stuff because new information came to light. Uh, this particular project was... The fence posts were way out there. I don't think that was the most helpful, uh, but I couldn't see any other way to do it. But but I've done it, so don't repeat what I've done. Find parts of what I've done, get tighter fence posts, a tighter focus on some very specific areas, and then go for it. And you might actually finish your project in a timely manner. <laughs> So final thoughts, is there any, something that we should have talked about that we didn't? Oh, uh, people uh, who uh, were helpful to me in getting this project done. There's, there's three particular people I would like to mention. Is this okay to do it now? Sure. Okay. Well, the, the first one is, is sitting here with me in the interview, and that's Jason Smith. And I mentioned his efforts before. And, and, and that, it didn't just stop there. Over the years, there have been hey, I found this, or hey, have you come across that? And they're, you know, sending stuff along. That was part of the annoyance because I thought I'd finished that section and had to go back. Uh, but, but that's the nature of the beast that I decided to tackle. Two other people, Alan Unsworth, who may not be too well-known to some, but uh, he's another uh, 
really helpful. He helped set up a kind of a Wikipedia sort of a thing uh, to try and keep track of all this stuff. And uh, uh, but Alan was really a good helper in finding, you know, letting me know of things that happened. Uh, another uh, good friend who goes back almost 40 years is, uh, no, he goes back 40 years. It is 40 years this year. John Dawson in England. Uh, John is a dear friend. Uh, we've met in person only two times in the last 40 years, and that's been when I've made trips to England. Uh, and, you know, in one case, a trip was in conjunction with a Mormon history tour, uh, Mormon History Association meeting and tour. And another case was a family trip to Scotland. And, and I, I couldn't be in Scotland and not drive down to where John lives and spend a day with John. Uh, but for decades, John was doing writing letters and picking up pieces of information uh, from some of the same kinds of people, but he'd sometimes get different information than I got because of questions that he'd ask. So those, those three men uh, were just absolutely critical in getting this book done. And I appreciate every one of them, Jason, especially you for getting, lighting the fire underneath me to get me going again. Um, that was, that was. Well, I've told you before, but uh, your fourth edition, uh, I think I came across it in 1991 or two. Mm. And um, it's, it's what lit my fire to, uh, to get into Mormon studies. Yeah, mm, yeah. So I owe you quite a bit. Well, thank you. So yeah, that's and you know my my family over the years has put up with it, and, <laughs> um, you know, and and you know all the dozens and dozens of church leaders who corresponded. You know, I to try and list all the names would be impossible. But just a lot of good people interested in the project. Well, Steve, last question. If people want to get in touch with you, how can they do that? Oh, I, uh, I, I prefer email. Uh, and you can write to slshields at gmail.com. Be sure Shields is spelled I before E. And, your, and your book is available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, the, right? The book can be found at Amazon and Barnes and Noble both. Uh, and uh, the the ebook, I, I realize... Uh, Many of us are not ready to enter the 21st century when it comes to books, but uh, the ebook was the format that could make it affordable for most. And at, I think it's under $10 yeah. ebook, you know, either uh, depending on which format. I mean, once you get the ebook, you can't tell that it's in a different format. It's just the reader app that you're using on your device is Barnes and Noble has a different one than Amazon has. There's nothing different between the two editions. So whoever you're typically buying eBooks from or whose reader you're using the most, uh, you know, go for that. If you go to Amazon, of course, you can always click your account to have a portion of your eligible sales be donated to John Whitmer Historical Association. Well, Steve, thanks again for being with us today. Well, Jason, thank you. I, I appreciate uh, spending some time with you and chatting about the new book and hope people will find it as interesting as you and I have over the years. We want to thank you for tuning in to the WhitmerCast. John Whitmer Historical Association is an educational nonprofit institution. For more information, visit jwha.info where you can meet our team and join the association, read past issues of the JWHA Journal, and get updates on upcoming conferences and events. Our theme music is I Love to Tell the Story, composed by Tom Moraine. This podcast is a production of John Whitmer Historical Association, copyright July 2022. All rights reserved.